Okay, so I want to briefly talk to you um, this evening about linear independence and basis, and this is found in section 4.3 of your book. So I'll start with this quote from Bill Cosby that I think really sums up uh, the idea of a basis. So he says sometimes in stand-up, my father established our relationship when I was seven years old. He looked at me and said, you know, I brought you in this world and I can take you out and it don't make no difference to me. I'll make another one look just like you. So the idea is that, you know, it's funny, but the point that he's making, if we think of linear algebra, is that because a mother and the father created the children, if the children are too bad, he can kill them and then he can make some more children. So the definition of linear independence is a set of vectors S is said to be linearly independent. If C1 V1, and that should be plus there instead of equals, C2 V2 plus all the way up to the nth vector Cn Vn equals zero. And that's if and only if all of those coefficients C1 to Cn are equal to zero. So we talked about this before, but linear independence just means that the only linear combination that can be made of the vectors to equal the zero vector has to be all of those vectors multiplied by zero. So if you thought about it as a system of equations, it would mean that if you took those vectors and made them the columns of a matrix, then the only solution to the homogeneous system of equations would have to be the trivial solution. So there's an important theorem called the spanning set theorem, and it says, you know, let the set of vectors S be equal to V1 to VP. So you have P of these vectors, and let H um, equal the span of V1 to VP. And so if there exists some V sub K, such that V sub K is a linear combination of the other vectors of S, then the set with V sub K removed also spans H. So what this means is that if you have those P vectors, if any one of those p vectors turns out to be a linear combination of the remaining vectors, then you could remove that kth vector and it would still, you know, the set S would still span the subspace H. So the second part to the theorem says if H is not equal to zero, then some subset of S is a basis for H. So that means that if you have a subset um, of H, um, then, I'm sorry, then, you know, some subset of S is a basis for H means that if I took out vectors um, that were linear combinations of the others in the set and the ones that were left over still span the set, then somewhere in there is a basis for that uh, actual subset or subspace H. So what if we have an example? So we have five vectors and we need to find a basis for the subspace span by those vectors. So we are given in a question that this, certainly they span some subspace. And so we need to find the ones that are linearly independent that also span. So the first thing we might do to determine which ones are linearly independent is just put those five vectors into a matrix and let them be the columns of that matrix. And so that's what we've done here. And then we can put this matrix into its reduced row echelon form. And so what we would have done is, you know, by doing reduced, putting something in reduced row echelon form, you're performing elementary row operations. And in essence, you're combining the rows and the columns to zero any rows or columns that happen to be um, linear combinations of the others. So it's actually a very um, um, useful way to determine which of the rows or columns are linearly dependent on the others. And so in this particular example, you see that we do get a zero um, row. And so the columns of R with leading ones point to the columns of A that are linearly independent. And so I asked why, and I think if you listen to what I just said, I've basically given you the explanation. Um, but there's something special that's happening to those columns or not happening to those columns that continue to have leading ones. And so in practice, what we would have done is once we put this into reduced or echelon form, every column that has a leading one actually points to um, a vector in the um, columns of A that are linearly independent. So in this particular case, the first four columns of our reduced row echelon um, matrix A, which I was calling R, have leading ones. So that means that vectors V1 to V4 are linearly independent. 
And it should be noted at this point that there's nothing special about those particular vectors. In other words, if we had moved V5 and put it in the location that V2 was in, then we would have found that you know V1, V3, V4, and V5 were linearly independent and V2 was dependent because, of course, the dependent relationship, um, you can move the vectors around and show that any particular one of them is dependent on the remaining ones. That's exactly what it means to be a basis. So another example we could, we could look at here um, is that you know, we could show that if T is a one-to-one -one linear transformation, and then if V1 to Vn are these vectors and they're linearly dependent, then so is a transformation of those linearly dependent vectors. So this is an interesting result because it says if the vectors that are in essence in your domain are linearly dependent, then if you transform those vectors you know, into the range, then the set of the transform vectors are also linearly dependent. So we can actually show that. So as a proof, you know, if the set of vectors is linearly dependent, then there exists an index i such that you know, the ci vi is a linear combination of the others. So as long as ci is not equal to zero, you see that I could take all of the other vectors and combine them in some sort of way to get the ith vector. So that's what it would mean for um, you know, that vector vi to be dependent. And so because a linear transformation of t is one to one, and so what does it mean to be one to one? It means that for every um, input into the transformation, there's exactly one output. So all of these properties for the linear transformation hold, um, we can actually show that those vectors are also um, linearly dependent as they go to the output. And so that's what you see there below. So since there is a linear combination of vectors in the set, TV1, TV2, on up to TVN, that is equal to TVI, the set then is linearly dependent, right? It's the same reasoning we use for the N vectors V1 to VN. So take a look at these and then be prepared to answer some questions on these slides um, on Tuesday.